And in the face of this overwhelming uncertainty of the human condition, where we have no idea what's going to happen tomorrow, we've got no idea what's going to happen 3,000 miles from here, we've got no idea what's going to happen to the fish in the bay, and we have no idea, uh, no idea, and so forth, endlessly, no idea, no idea. Well, it's your response to uncertainty that is the real you. Welcome to the License to Lead podcast. I'm Patty Fay. This podcast is for physicians or anyone who thinks healthcare needs a transformation led by physicians. License to Lead means that physicians are charged with and must be in charge of guiding the vision and the culture of healthcare systems. Hi, everyone. Welcome to the License to Lead podcast. My guest today is Dr. J.C. Spender, an expert in the field of business theory and management. Dr. Spender is a professor at the Kosminski University in Warsaw, an emeritus research fellow at Rutgers, and he's the former dean of a business school. He's published eight books and written over 100 articles and book chapters, and he writes about business innovation, business theory, and ethics, and the history of management education. Dr. Spender earned his PhD at the Manchester Business School in the UK, And then he gilded that PhD lily when he was awarded an honorary doctorate in economics by the Lund University School of Economics and Management. His book that caught my attention was co-authored with Robert R. Locke, and it was titled Confronting Managerialism, How the Business Elite and Their Schools Threw Our Lives Out of Balance. Listeners have heard me use the acronym BSM or Business School Mindset to describe the ideology of graduate business education primarily the mindset associated with MBA programs. This ideology has a formal name, managerialism. The idea that there's a body of knowledge or training in a curriculum that's called management and that people with this kind of training, managers, are the people best equipped to run all organizations and all professions, healthcare and medicine included. I reached out to Dr. Spender to see if he would help us understand what managerialism is and whether it plays a role in what healthcare and medicine look like today. And to my delight and amazement, he said, yes, Dr. Spender, welcome to the License to Lead podcast. (laughs) Thank you very much indeed. Uh, That was a very nice introduction. Very friendly. That's great. I'm so glad to talk with you. Are you up for diving right into managerialism? Okay, managerialism. Yep, that's certainly a term of art these days. And it's attracting a lot of incoming fire. Really? From people. And was the reason, of course, that we, Bob Locke and I, did our little book, which was a bit of a kind of an indulgence. Mm -hmm. Uh, An indulgence, I think, would be the right way of putting it. The book was mostly written by Bob a speed that was absolutely unspeakably amazing. And I did a little bit here and there. But basically, if for those of you that uh, bother to read this book, which apparently sells quite well, the book is is largely a reflection of, of Bob's uh, way of thinking about this. My own thinking about managerialism is probably a little different. I, I don't simply want to make it a target and assume it's the villain of the piece. I mean, when you introduced this, uh, you said the assumption that there is a body of knowledge, which is the appropriate body of knowledge for running an organization such as a uh, healthcare organization. I think that's slight mischaracterization. Okay. It's a rather defensive characterization. I mean, the, the essence of managerialism is to do with a contest of values. It's the question, what do you value? Mm-hmm. And the managerialist accusation is that you overvalue uh, the concerns of the organization of which you are a manager. And typically in the, in the healthcare discussion uh, that we would have, it would be overvaluing the concerns of the organization, which are presumed to be financial and maybe political. Uh, rather than the issues which might concern the patients. You know, why is this organization not looking after me? Uh, But at the same time, it seems to come into conflict 
you know, with the Hippocratic Oath, uh, with the deep set of values, uh, which are typically inculcated in a medical education. So for people who are medics, there is an assumption that the organization is about, one imagines, I'm not a medic, so I can't speak to that, but I, I imagine that the whole discussion about managerialism in the healthcare sector is a conflict between the doctor's sense of what's valuable, mm -hmm. whether or not it's bedside manner or operation efficiency or a diagnostic correctness of uh, correctly diagnosing drugs in the interests of the patient rather than the in interests of the drug maker or the hospital, etc. So the, these conflicts of value. We talk about a conflict of values regarding putting patients and patient care and delivering high quality patient care, that value versus a focus on profits. Right. So this is one of the unavoidable consequences of privatizing the healthcare system, that uh, profit comes into the picture. Whereas if you have a completely public as sort of tried in the UK, where I came from. I mean, the National Health Service doesn't regard profit in the same way as the American medical system does. So these tensions in the UK are slightly different from the way they are uh, here in the US. But yes, I mean, it's a contrast and contest, maybe, between patient-oriented you know, what we might call patient-facing values <laughs> versus uh, accounting-facing values. There are a couple of problems here. I mean, having made this cheap shot against a healthcare organization saying you're too worried about profit and so forth, it's like, okay, let's just wait a moment. Um, what exactly do you mean by socially oriented or patient-oriented? Are you presuming that there is some coherent pattern of values here? Right. Mm -hmm. Now, well, of course, doctors know that even if you're closely attending to what we might call patient-oriented values, there are times, desperate indeed, when you have to practice triage. Sure. You have, to, or what uh, was famously called for a while, death panels. Right. Okay? that if you think that the medical system uh, has no constraints on the resources, then of course it's easy to say it should be patient facing. Whereas the reality for doctors running a hospital is that resources are highly likely to be uh, restricted, constrained, uh, unavailable, disappearing, and so forth. You know, so if you consider, let's say the supply of oxygen, uh, in Indian hospitals today, what are doctors to do? Who are they supposed to give the oxygen to? How do you work that through? Even without considering any of the issues, which are is the charge, the managerial uh, charge, which is you're too concerned with profit. It's like, no, 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 there's not profit here. There's simply the fact that in the real world, resources are typically constrained one way or another. Right, right. I think you're making a great point. We don't have a distilled down version of values, one applied to each profession or each area of interest. There isn't purely financially oriented or, or profit oriented set of values that lives in this population of people concerned with management. And there isn't just strictly patient-oriented or patient-facing values in this group of people in healthcare, physicians and nurses, et cetera. So there are financial concerns there as well. And there are political concerns and concerns about our families and our own time. Right. So I absolutely agree. So then is it more, how is it apportioned? Right. So in my view, the first step to having an intelligent discussion it's about recognizing that this is about conflicting values. Yep. It's not about believing that social uh, goals are always better than financial goals. Financial goals are typical of business, greedy business people who want to maximize their own benefit at the expense of society. This kind of debate is completely fruitless, aside from being idiotic. Fruitless and idiotic. <laughs> right. I'll, I'll go with that. Right. So I think that the issues of managerialism in the healthcare sector are extraordinarily important. 
and they're the cutting edge of getting a sense of how on earth do we manage these systems. You know, I already reminded us of this appalling metaphor of death panels, you know, which is a sort of highly politicized way of talking about triage, which all doctors are familiar with. Right. So, yes, we have to apportion resources. And there are very complicated and very emotional and also very political debates about how do we apportion care. Now, there's a second dimension of this, which is that uh, amongst the uh, people who haven't really thought very carefully about these subjects, there is, there is the canard. I, I love that uh, term, canard, uh, outrageous, stupid claim generally made for political reasons. There is the canard that you can have a hospital system which is entirely oriented towards some imagined set of patient-facing values. Yeah, that would be pretty implausible. Uh, right, uh, but popular still. <laughs> I mean, it's like, aren't, isn't the hospital supposed to be caring for us? And the point I want to make here is that, well, not exactly. We live in a society that understands that organization itself is an incredible achievement and resource. So the canard is that the organization itself does not have any needs that necessarily conflict with values like patient-facing values. But the organization itself has needs. Now, uh, I've not actually done this, so I'm going to give you an example okay. <laughs> that may fail hopelessly. But I imagine um, many of, of, of the people listening have been involved in, let's say, something like a college debating club. Right? And any of you that were actually involved know that there's an awful lot of work involved in making that work. Right. I think your point is even a small, low stakes organization, such as a college debating club, requires a big input of, of a, an energy expenditure. Right. And that's the whole point. Every organization generates, you know, what engineers are called entropic losses, okay, frictional losses. And any organization, therefore, has the need to make up for those losses. So there's work involved. Going back to the example of the debating society, uh, I, I'm sure at least some of the people who have some personal experience of these kinds of clubs know that there arrives a point at which you say, I'm out of here. People don't appreciate me. It's not going the way I want. It's a source of political conflict between myself and other students. Uh, I'm done with this. Okay, this is exactly the kind of problem that happens every day in every organization. And it's immensely draining. The work of keeping an organization together, maintaining it, fighting off entropy can wear people down or can burn up so much bandwidth that they throw up their hands and, and kind of give it up. Right. There's, no, there's nothing left. Mm -hmm. So I'm very sympathetic to uh, doctors who say, look, these blank, blank, blank people up there who are organizing the whole medical unit have turned me into a data entry clerk. This is not what I became a doctor to do. And on top of that, they have devised a system which is so systematically challenging because every time you enter one piece of data, it disappears from another place or I have to re-enter the data and it's driving me crazy. Exhausting. Exhausting. I mean, really depleting people's mental bandwidth so that they don't have the intellectual capacity or energy to bring to the patient care process. Right. But the answer to that is not, let's stop doing it, because the organization has its own needs. Right. And it's, and it's incredibly difficult to organize healthcare today. And it's extraordinarily expensive. Mm -hmm. You know, facilities. I mean, if we go back 200 years, because my great, 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 whatever it is, uh, grandfather was a, was a doctor who actually invented the term osteoarthritis. Really? So in the, in the middle of the 19th century, he's in Bath in England, 
He's treating his patients out of his front room, the same way as all family doctors used to work. And the costs of doing that are non-trivial. And in addition, he probably has to depend upon the services of his wife or daughter or aunt or somebody to keep accounts to find out who's actually paying their bills and who's not and so forth. So this is an extraordinarily complicated and challenging organizational process. Now, if we go back another thousand years to maybe imagining that medicine concerned nothing other uh, than dancing around the fire and, 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 and having herbal potions. Right. The shaman. Even then, who's going to brew the herbal potions? Who's going to light the fire? Who's going to make sure everybody turns up at the right time? So the canard here is that medical patient concerns stand entirely contrary to economic concerns. It doesn't help to think like that. The point is that, that to, today, the, a hospital or a medical uh, outfit is an extremely complicated economic entity, whatever it delivers. Correct. I think that that is getting to the crux when you mentioned the clash of values. And I would think of it as a prioritization and always a situation where in any given moment, you have to make a decision, whether it's a, a triage and being in some kind of unfortunate uh, situation where you have to decide who gets the oxygen who, or who doesn't get the oxygen. There are factors at play there and somebody has to make a decision. Ideally, that somebody is going to be an individual with a long educational on-ramp and deep commitment to patients and a lot of tacit knowledge about the trade-offs as opposed to somebody making that decision on the basis purely of economics without any background or any knowledge of what's actually going on in that room or in that situation. Okay. There's two things that we can say about that. One is that we are often ignorant of what we may call the ethical issues. We sometimes do things unthinkingly. So yes, the idea of, of a long education is a very complicated idea. Obviously, medical people have to learn the chemistry and the mechanics of providing medical care. But the hope for any educational system is that it is complemented by an understanding of the ethical issues. What uh, the Greeks used to call phronesis, the appropriateness to the circumstances in which you find yourself. There is a tendency in the educational business for us to push out the phronesis elements in favor of something that is theoretically sound and so forth, which we see as a contest when you're making decisions between believing that there is some principle that you can attach yourself to versus the actual burden of making a human being type decision in a human being type place. Now, the point I'm trying to make here is that the educational system that uh, we have, that I have experienced, has overemphasized the place of principles. So when you were talking about a long on-ramp, you might uh, have been implying that people would learn what are the principles that guide decision-making in these circumstances. And then when you're faced with some choice, then you can draw on these principles because you've learned what these principles are. And uh, there's a big literature today in business ethics, you know, the, the sort of idea of surely there are some principles that we can ask business people to, to follow rather than not pay attention to these principles, which are uh, so socially oriented, and to focus instead on their own greed and and uh, as, as we say in the trade, MSV, maximizing shareholder value. We have been trained in ways that emphasize principle over what some people might call practice. Anybody that's had real responsibility as a manager or as a surgeon or as a military officer or as a pilot or it's a, knows there comes a point at which the exigencies of the situation, that's the specifics of the situation, 
demand that you put principle to one side. Nice. And act on some other basis. Yes. Tacit knowledge. Well, uh, now you're dragging me into my own specialist area of the nature of organizational knowledge and tacit knowledge and so forth. Oh, Um, I didn't realize that, JC. I think tacit knowledge is really a core element of why I... uh, But then if you were an academic, I would say, well, well, excuse me, uh, Professor Payne, uh, would you just like to stop for a moment and tell me what you mean by tacit knowledge? Because if you can explain it, it's no longer tacit. Boom. Yes, exactly. And that's why I would not necessarily agree with your characterization of the long on-ramp deliverable there being the principles, but rather the long on-ramp, the primary deliverable there or receivable maybe for the physicians is tacit knowledge, is this accumulation of information and understanding based on myriad experiences and things that they're not even able to articulate, things that really come to bear in the exigencies of the moment when a decision has to be made. Right. And you would hope in in the medical schools, you know, I'm thinking of that that incredible picture. Uh, I've forgotten who it's by of of in the operating theatre when they're they're all gathered around watching the surgeon take apart a corpse um, in the in their theatre. Um, very famous pa- painting. I've, the name of the painter escapes mm-hmm. me. With an audience above looking down. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. All all hang, hanging mm-hmm. over the shall we say, the corrective, the counterbalance to teaching principle is practice, gaining experience of practice. So in the medical business, you spend your time going around with the uh, doctor in charge, uh, going through the wards, clustering around the uh, end of the bed. And then you're going to be asked, you know, what would you recommend? What's your diagnosis here? And so forth. This is the heartland of, in my view, at the heartland of medical training because it attends to the tacit in the way that you're suggesting, but there is nothing to attend to if you have no theoretical principles to guide the discussion. The theoretical principles create the language with which you can talk about the specifics. Scaffolding. Scaffolding, I'll go with scaffolding. Okay, now here's the question in business schools. What practice do they attend to? I'll save you being polite because the answer is zip. Hmm. How can you build a curriculum around zip? Well, that's one of the problems. You build a curriculum around what the faculty is interested in publishing. If you ask the average business school professor where the curriculum came from, unless they have spent some time with history of management education, which I have to tell you is an endangered and exceedingly narrow line of interest in, in my community. If they've never attended to the history of management education, they will have no answer at all. Or they might make up one and say, well, sometime in the past, lost in the mist of time, uh, a group of business people came and told the school what they needed. And the answer is, if you've ever actually tried to get business people in a business school environment to tell the faculty what they would like to have taught, if you've never experienced that, you have no tacit knowledge of the fact that this is a recipe for complete embarrassment and failure. Ah. It's like, do not embarrass your funders. That's not good strategy if you're the dean of the school. And how would they be embarrassing their funders? By asking them to apparently have some knowledge of what the business school can do for them as business people or for their businesses. I see. Okay. So people who are hiring the folks who have graduate business degrees, I guess, based on what you're saying, would not be able to articulate what they're looking for or what they need. Right. You're very getting very close to the flame there. Because if you actually were to do that, you would have a very remarkable experience. If you can avoid embarrassing them, they will say, we have no idea. There is no well-engineered relationship between the business school curriculum and what business people would say is needed in terms of education, even if you gave them time to work that out. Why do you reckon that's the case? 
I don't reckon it's the case. I have experienced it as the case. Okay. What do you ascribe that to? Why, why is that? <laughs> on more than one occasion, I have uh, sat on one occasion for as long as two years on a project to have the business community inform the school about how the curriculum should be rejigged, reformed, revolutionized, and so forth. This is all part of the internal theater of the business school. Yes, we're attending to the real world because somebody is telling us that what we teach has no actual relevance in the real world. Now, there's a huge, uh, vigorous literature, and I would mention my friend Martin Parker, whose book is Shut Down the Business Schools, which uh, I think you know about. And there's a huge literature that runs along those lines. So to try to summarize your point, there's a boatload of criticism about the content of business school curriculum, accusations that there's actually no connection. Some of the studies I've seen that there's no connection between having, for instance, an MBA and then ability to perform in the business world, that there's no connection between curriculum, getting an MBA, and then performance in the actual business world. And so what you're saying is, in an effort to address that criticism, people have brought together members of the business community in probably a lot of different settings, and you've been involved in, in it yourself, and asked them, what do you need? What would it look like? What would this curriculum look like if it were really going to serve the business community? And, and then what comes up is crickets. Uh, there's no response, no feedback, or no content that is coughed up by the business community saying, this is what we need. So why do you think that's the case, JC? Why do you think they're unable to articulate what they need from the business school? That is a fascinating, fascinating question. And I'm appalled to realize that I've spent 50 years <laughs> plodding around in this literature. So if you were my, if you were my uh, doctoral student or research student, you know, I would say, yes, there are one or two interesting things that you might want to read where we have uh, people who really understand business talking in ways that connect with the business schools and curriculum. And, and the granddaddy here for anybody interested is uh, Chester Barnard, who wrote a book published in 1938 called The Functions of the Executive. Now, that's a bear of a book to read, but it is uh, absolutely the clearest attempt to bridge the gap between academic uh, thinking and you know, what business schools are teaching. Leaving that to one side, the thing that is causing the problem most obviously today is the tendency in business schools to pursue, as I was saying before, principles slash theories at the expense of tacit knowledge about practice. And this is for a perfectly obvious reason that you get no career rewards for writing about the second. All of the emphasis is getting, uh, getting publications which emphasize principle and theory. Like any group of people, uh, business school faculty respond to the incentive system that they're given, and the incentives are for a certain kind of publishing. Then there's a question of why is the whole publishing apparatus of business schools, first of all, different from medical schools, where the purpose of publishing in, in medical journals is very different. It's not principle. It's typically reporting experiments. We're waiting as we speak on the uh, publications of data about the effect of vaccines on children under 12 years old. And the whole world is sitting there breathless and impatient and anxious. Okay? There's nobody sitting impatient and anxious waiting for business school publications. That's one thing. Except, and this is the, my point, except the young professor who's coming up for tenure evaluation, who's anxiously waiting <laughs> the publication of this paper that we know from research is not likely to be read by more than two people. And what would be typical in a robust academic background to, if you've got a, a good article or an average article, how many times would it be cited? Right. Well, you see, now we deal with citations, which is a metric that obviously has some kind of purpose. 
I have accidentally, obviously, acquired a couple of articles which are quite highly cited, not as highly cited as some, so I'm not claiming that I'm a highly cited author. I'm just saying that I have a couple of amongst the various 100, 200 or so things which the world is aware of me having published. I have a couple that are quite highly cited. So here's the thing. I receive through the uh, automated apparatus of our community, I receive notification that this article has been cited in this recent publication. So I can go to the recent publication and I can examine it to see what they have made of the thing of mine that they cited. Now, my top citing paper, and this number is just put in as in order to enable us to talk about this, not to either claim anything. Okay, my top cited publication is a 1996 paper, which is cited by something approaching 7,000 other authors, which is relatively high in our community. It doesn't match the 150,000 citations of some people who talk about methods, different field. Now, when I read the paper citing my paper, and I speak of having read a large number of these 7,000 papers citing my work, it has never, ever once been clear to me that the author citing my paper has actually read it. Oh, dear. I have never once received any critique of Spender said this, Spender said that, Spender said this, is, which, is, which is interesting, Spender said this, which is clearly idiotic, or oh, this is clearly incorrect. Now, here's my answer to your very profound question, which deals with the relationship between business school academics and the real world. About 50 years ago, because of the way our community works, we lost the ability to critique. Critique was no longer important. What was important was a new claim, what we politely call a contribution. If you were to speak to some of the editors of the journals that, that uh, are absolutely crucial to our professional careers and ask them what they're looking for, they're going to probably use the word contributions, by which they mean some addition, extension, elaboration, maybe even correction of theory. They will almost certainly never use the word critique. And yet we know, when I say we know, I'm talking about academics beyond the business schools, people who are interested in the history of the development of thought, interested in the development of civilization. They know that critique is the principal mechanism. So when Luther goes and whacks the nails on the door of the church in Wittenberg, okay, this is a critique of literature that everybody in the community is familiar with. And it's through critique that we make progress. And we have been involved in a trick which makes the history of management education very interesting to see exactly how this trick was pulled, where critique was suppressed in favor of new empirical evidence. Hmm. Critique seemed to too many people to be simply damaging, saying what is wrong, whereas what is needed is progress. We have this metaphor of progress. So the medical profession is very interested in progress, new drugs, new uh, operations, procedures, new methods of treatment, etc. So yes, they're, they're interested in progress, but at the same time, they're also interested in critiquing ineffective methods. There's a very, very famous example in medical history about uh, a physician called Semmelweis dealing with puerperal fever. This is, you know, birth-related fever. Oh, you know mm -hmm. the story? Yes, yes. Okay. And Semmelweis, Ignaz Semmelweis, at the end of the 19th century was ignored for right. decades. Meanwhile, mothers and mothers and babies right. die. People just didn't really believe that. They, they weren't ready to hear it. They weren't ready to hear it. I believe people were going directly from autopsies on rotting cadavers to delivering babies and 
Semmelweis said, come, I think the problem, <laughs> yeah, I think the problem might be in this, in what you might be carrying from the corpse to the mother and child. Right. The loss of mm-hmm. the tradition of critique, which was very vigorous in the social sciences, the loss of the tradition of critique, particularly in business schools, is in fact a deadly, fatal condition. I have been trying to, should we say, speak to this thought for 50 years. I came into this business in 1971. Is it J.C. Uh, Semmelweis? <laughs> <laughs> well, there are no rotting corpses. Well, actually, that's not true. There are hundreds of rotting <laughs> <laughs> there are rotting corpses. Yes, I think I think we can work on this analogy. Yes, um, but uh, I, I came into this uh, business in 1971. I came into the management education business in 1971, uh, having been in various kinds of business, including working for Rolls Royce as an engineer on uh, nuclear propulsion and working for IBM on what was then cutting edge corporate level computing and so forth. And when I arrived in business school, I was very surprised by what people were saying. And particularly, I was shocked to discover that they were not really interested in managers as people slash actors. I mean, they had no feeling that they needed to be sympathetic to what managers did. They were interested in management, perhaps, but not managers. No, they were, they were interested in their own careers, <laughs> in getting published, tenured, and pensioned. Now, that's, that's, that's painting it with a very broad brush, and I can name a very small number of people uh, whose concerns were somewhat aligned with mine. You know, So this is like uh, people wandering about in the forest recognizing each other. And I was very fortunate when I came into this business school community to find one person who happened to be running the business school who was very sympathetic to, uh, to what I was interested in, which uh, because I had been a manager and I was a, a very indifferent manager. I was, should we say, a jobbing manager. I could you know, keep myself out of trouble, but it was not my medium, which gets me to my belief that management is an art form and reducing it to a science, which is a sort of additional set of problems here. Well, leaving that on one side, I regarded management as an art form. And why was that the case? In one of the uh, industries in which I had been involved, in this case was in the city of London, I had worked for somebody of a modest background and modest educational achievement. But as soon as you met him, you knew immediately this was his medium. He loved it. He understood it. Now, that feeling, I mean, when you look at a visual artist, you know that there are some visual artists who really, really know what they're up to. And there's a very large number of people who don't, who can still, uh, you know, produce a nice illustration or whatever. But if you're looking at a Velazquez, as all artists do, they wish that they understood art the way he understood art. So he's often called the artist's artist. And any of you that have been to the Prado and stood in front of Les Meninis will understand that this guy knew something that practically nobody else did. So it was similarly my experience. Expand a little bit on this person that you're describing that really got it. Uh, Got what? And yeah, say more. Well, uh, for those of you that are interested in the details, his name was Dick Tarling. And he went to jail for two years in Singapore for financial finaglings because he fell on his sword for his boss, a guy called Jim Slater. So if you know anything about the history of British financial operations in the 1970s, you know that Jim Slater precipitated what was then called the, um, the secondary banking crisis, a bit similar to the financial crisis of 2008, but a rehearsal for it. And Dick was caught in a situation, irrespective of the fact that he got caught in this kind of very complicated financing web. He had this absolutely extraordinary natural ability. And it was, I mean, it was mind-blowing to me to watch him at work. I'm an engineer. I love diesel engines. In one of my sort of alter egos, I'm fixing diesel engines on boats. 
this is happiness. Mm -hmm. You know, in in the old days, uh, engineers used to have a a hearing stick, a stick maybe about 18 inches long. You put one end to your ear, and then you put the other to the block of the engine because you can hear what's going on in there. Hear the vibration. So this this is diagnosis. And coming back to the medical profession, I mean, uh, I I would argue, and you know, I don't know that much about medicine, but I would argue the diagnosis is the most fundamental skill because that links principle to practice. Mm-hmm. Yes. Yes. Okay. If you're a poor diagnostician, you're constantly recommending principles which are inappropriate. Uh, back to phrenesis again, they are not the appropriate. Uh, principles for this particular circumstance. And it's like you described this fellow as really getting it. And I'm uh, assuming you're talking about the world of business and finance. No, 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 no. This is the interesting point. There is no such general world okay. in which there are general principles. That's the canard that the business schools have adopted in order to do the business they do, which is to churn out students. They're not interested in relating to the real world. If you're relating to the real world, you have to come to the specifics of the situation. You have to have diagnostic capability. This is the problem. You have to be in in the businesses in a practical sense. Right. And I mean, you know business people, I'm sure. And they succeed or fail according to the degree at which they can see what's important. So I sometimes describe education as learning to see. And at one stage in my career, I was uh, in the strange business of of selling money. (laughs) That is going around to various companies in England, uh, suggesting that they sold me their capital equipment and then rented it back from me. The point being that this is a way in which they can free up some of the capital that they they put into equipment. So I used to arrive at the company. I used to go out onto the shop floor. And within 15 minutes, just by watching the behavior on the shop floor, I knew what condition this firm was in, whether or not they could support a loan. Yes. Yes. I mean, and that is that accumulation of tacit knowledge that you don't even, you wouldn't be able to write down that, that approach no. for somebody so that they could adopt it and they could walk into the next shop floor and have that experience because it it's unknown even to you. Right. My dream of management education, which I've been trying to put in, in digestible form, readable form, is helping management, managers, managerial students, helping companies learn what to look for in the situations in which they find themselves because every situation is unique. So it's exactly the same dealing with human relations, okay? I mean, if you've got some principles, you know, that your girlfriend has to be tall and blonde, you might miss on a great opportunity (laughs) of somebody who would be a life partner, you know? So it comes back to this uh, methodological or philosophical contest between principle and practice, principle and immediacy, sympathy with the material that you're dealing with. Mm -hmm. And what hospitals have to sustain is attending to the patient as an individual, as a unique historical occurrence, not an example of a large population of disease sufferers. You know, the lesson from principle is you have to categorize, diagnose to categorize, and then suppress the individual. And any doctor of real worth is going to say, that's the path to our special kind of medical hell. Right, right. I am an individual as a doctor, and my patient is an individual. Now, the hospital system, of course, can't do that. You can't engineer a hospital system without categorizing patients. So we have different wards for different diseases, different buildings for different conditions, outpatients, inpatients, you know, MRI, et cetera. So whole thrust of organization, which is the pursuit of effective allocation and use of scarce materials, this runs against the attention to the specifics of the individual. And even it's even worse than that, because doctors know that there are some days in which Mr. Smith 
is feeling okay and optimistic. And there are some days in which he's absolutely desperate and can scarcely get out of bed. And if you ignore that, you ignore Mr. Smith. And you write him down as patient number 27, and I gave him this drug regime, and apparently there was no improvement. You can't do much medicine that way. But the whole apparatus of the hospital has to run, it would seem, from categories. Mm -hmm. Now, here's, here's really what the question is, managerialism. Okay, so yeah, we understand the hospital is a very expensive, sophisticated economic apparatus, and efficiency and these other kinds of notions uh, loom very large. And if you can't organize the hospital in efficiently, then it's, it's going to collapse. But then comes the moment that I was speaking about earlier, when the person in charge, if they are still in charge, and they have not, in fact, been completely overtaken by the apparatus, right. which is what happens to many, many managers. They get overtaken by the, by the apparatus of the organization that they're involved with. And they, they're merely a decision-making and decision distribution point. If they're still in charge, if they're still, got academics might call some agency and some impact, they themselves are present so there's a literature here dealing with the notion of being present. Yes. So if you sacrificed yourself to principle, you're no longer present. You're simply articulating the principles, which is one of the problems of dealing with AI, you know, which of course runs from principles. Right. So you, you, you end up just reciting or repeating principles uh, that, that can be written down and you right. are parroting uh, the principles. Right. Right. Mm -hmm. You're a Principal parata. <laughs> mm -hmm. Okay. Yep. <laughs> but if you are still present, that is the point at which you say, I use my power to put principle to one side and make a different decision. That's you making your agency present. Now, every manager knows this because they deal with it very frequently. Mm -hmm. Consider now the whole eviction crisis that we're plunging into. If you're a manager and you have a portfolio of 2,500 uh, properties and you are being told to keep your um, late payment or your non-payment ratio below 27%, the numbers are beginning to drive you, the principles. So it's, it's the numbers speak. So the part of what we want to shout about when it comes to the business school ethic is they're being taught to let the numbers speak. Even business ultimately is shaped by agency. The points at which you say, I know the numbers mean that we have to evict Mr. and Mrs. Uh, Thompson, but I'm not going to do it. She told me that she's got a check coming and she's told me this for, she's told me it three times before, but I'm hoping that this time she's going to help me if I help her. Okay, so this is a completely different kind of thing. Of course, if you're a subordinate manager in a firm, you get no reward from this turning out right. You only get beaten over the head for when it doesn't turn out right. So the boss is saying, I thought I told you to keep the ratio below 27%. And you let the Thompsons that's put us up to 28.5%. Now, head office can read that off the data they collect, and I'm going to be in trouble. Thank you very much. It really is an unwillingness to acknowledge the importance of the human factors in business. You can turn that upside down. And then this gets to a whole literature on which I have been trying to write for many years. If you accept that the world is susceptible to principle, then you're presuming that the world is certain and identifiable so that you know what's going on and you know what principles to apply. But if you're a reasonable person, and you seem like a pretty reasonable person to me, okay, there's another description of the world which is much more pertinent and much deeper, much more interesting, which is the human condition is one of uncertainty, of never actually knowing for certain. 
And in the face of this overwhelming uncertainty of the human condition, where we have no idea what's going to happen tomorrow, we've got no idea what's going to happen 3,000 miles from here, we've got no idea what's going to happen to the fish in the bay, in Tampa Bay, and we have no idea, uh, no idea, and so forth, endlessly, no idea, no idea. It's like, stop, don't tell me I have no idea. I know I don't have any idea. Well, it's your response to uncertainty that is the real you. If you're just parroting principle, that's not you. The real you is how do you respond to the uncertainties in life situations that you wish to engage. And it sounds like we have in the business schools, people clinging to this idea of there being principles that you can build a curriculum around or do your research on and those will serve them and serve society and people can emerge from this, uh, absorbing this curriculum and go out into the world, this very certain world and apply these principles and successfully run businesses. And I believe you're saying, uh, no. (laughs) Right. So uh, rather than certain determinable, okay, we don't know everything, Mm -hmm. So now the interesting question is, how did it come about that business, which after all is driven by uncertainty? There's a literature here I won't bother you with, but the very fact of uncertainty is the origin of business, which is that I will sell you this for $10 Mm -hmm. because you don't know that as far as I'm concerned, it's only worth eight. So that's a kind of uncertainty. Uncertainty is the drive behind business. I don't want to derail here too much. Right. But it does make me think of buyer beware, you know, that 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 is an underpinning feature, buyer beware. And that, that gives us a point of contrast with medicine and with healthcare in that in the professions in medicine, we basically are the fiduciary for our patients because we have this long on ramp and of both, you know, technical and acquired knowledge and tacit knowledge. And it puts us in a position of having more information than our patients. And so we are fiduciaries for them because of the imbalance of power. Right. So, so, I mean, this gets us back to the very first point the contest of values. Because what you're alluding to there is a universe of medical discourse. When medical people talk to each other, they're using a language and a set of ideas. That universe of discourse is not like that of the universe of discourse of economic matters. Mm -hmm. That's where the conflict of values comes from. The economic universe has different values. Right. And obviously efficiency is a very significant value, you know, because that's waste. Okay. If you have resources, you don't waste them. But then what is the lacuna, the absence in the business school is knowing what other ideas actually drive this discourse other than avoiding waste. And the problem is that the business school has very little to say about that universe in which economic values are embedded. So earlier on in the conversation, I was saying, understand that hospital is a very large, significant economic institution that has economic values. It has to have economic values. There has to be a discourse there that deals with its existence as an economic entity. I have a question for you on that. I certainly see the point that it is an economic entity and requires that language be spoken. If somebody wanted to very effectively manage that economic entity, would getting an MBA provide what's needed? Uh, uh, Can I stop for a second? (laughs) Yes, of course. Go ahead, JC. Well, my intriguing guest, the author, scholar, and former business school dean, Dr. J.C. Spender, had to take a phone call. And I recognize that this might be a good spot to wrap up this episode. 
I left you with a real cliffhanger that's going to have to wait until part two of this interview. Do MBA degrees bring necessary skills to our healthcare systems? We did cover some fascinating territory. At the beginning, we were in, uh, I don't know, violent agreement on the subject of tacit knowledge and conflicting values, what I've referred to as a clash of ideologies between the business school mindset and the profession of medicine. Then Dr. Spender dove into the unknown when he talked about the disconnect between the needs of the business community and the curriculum of the business schools. It strikes me that that's a chasm of values and language as well. Darn, I wish I would have plunged into that a little more deeply with him. He talked about the deadly lack of critique in the business literature and the abject irrelevance of much of the business literature, posing as science when art and humanity is what's needed. Those are my words, not his. When JC talked about the business school propensity to emphasize and cling to principles, it clarified a lot of the controversy and criticism of graduate business education. If you believe you're hewing to fundamental truths and you're applying a science to your job as a manager, that permits disregard of context and ethical concerns, and it allows you to duck away from the actual burden of, as JC put it, human being type decisions in a human being type place. My favorite concept that JC presented in this episode is the one that I led in with at the beginning of this podcast, when he said, it's your response to uncertainty that is the real you. In the next License to Lead podcast, we go farther down this path and discuss the monetization of imagination and the theme of both podcasts, which is the need for leaders and managers to speak multiple languages like Hola, como estas? Or Ich spreche ein bisschen Deutsch. Kidding, that's not what he was talking about. JC also dives into how we cloud conversations within organizations by using the notion of trust when our purpose is actually monetizing to satisfy shareholder demands. It's a terrific conversation. And Professor Spender had very little inclination to agree with me in part one. Remember this? No, 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 no. In part two, he eclipses that with five no's. No, 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 on, no, on the contrary. So no worries that at any point he's going to become a patty patsy. That ain't happening. If you want more information and opinions, I put a boatload of spenderisms in my newsletter. From phronesis to hearing sticks to the identity of that familiar oil painting of the operating room theater. I'll be back in two weeks with part two of the License to Lead interview with Professor J.C. Spender. Thanks, everyone, for all of your care and caring. Thanks for listening to the License to Lead podcast. Be sure to visit licensedtoleadpodcast.com to join the conversation, access the show notes, and sign up for our newsletter. Leave us a message with your provocative question or your thoughtful comments. You might inspire a future episode of the License to Lead podcast. Thanks so much, everyone. 